Good morning, and welcome to Palm Sunday Worship here at First United Methodist Church of Waxahachie, Texas. My name is Kevin Tully, and we are so pleased that you have chosen to worship with us during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. How we long to be with you once again. We are praying for you. We trust that you are sheltering in place and uh, doing everything that is responsible for helping flatten the curve and uh, to help limit the spread of the virus. As I mentioned, today is Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week. This coming Friday, we will have an additional service, a Good Friday service that will once again be online. We hope that you will join us for that. In this morning's worship, we will be celebrating Holy Communion together. You can prepare for this, even if you are not yet ready, by gathering the elements. Grape juice, grape drink, um, of course, um, alcoholic or even non-alcoholic wine, um, apple juice, any fruit of the vine would be appropriate. And then for the bread, bread, rolls, um, wafers, crackers, all of them will be appropriate. And when the right time comes, after we have participated in the liturgy, you at home will be able to also share in the sacrament. We have given permission, been given permission by our resident bishop, Bishop Mike Lowry, to celebrate the sacrament in this way during this special time. And now, since you are online with us, and since God has promised to be with us wherever we are, let us prepare our hearts for worship as we listen to this morning's prelude.
Jesus was welcomed into the holy city of Jerusalem by those who waved palm branches with shouts of praise, let us open our hearts to receive the Savior as we worship God together. to his table, 
all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In, In the, the name, name of Jesus Christ, Christ you, you are, are forgiven. forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And, and also with, with you. Lift up your hearts. We, we lift, lift them up to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to give, give our, our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven. We praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come. Thy, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. body of Christ broken for you the blood of Christ shed for us 
and for our salvation. Thanks be to God. Let us give thanks to God as we pray together. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. stories of Jesus I love to hear things I would ask him to tell me if he were here scenes by the wayside tales of the sea stories of Jesus tell them to me First let me hear how the children stood round his knee, and I shall fancy his blessing resting on me. Words full of kindness, deeds full of grace, all to the love light of Jesus' face. Into the city I follow the children's band, waving a branch of the palm tree high in my hand. One of his arrows, yes, I would see. Loudest hosannas, Jesus is King. The sermon text for this morning comes to us from the Gospel according to Matthew, the 27th chapter, the 15th through the 26th verses. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. 
At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So they had gathered. Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man. For today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas! Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? All of them said, Let him be crucified. Then he asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So, when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of these words. Thanks be to God. Well, this Lent has been been very strange for us, hasn't it? It's been an interesting journey with the COVID-19 pandemic. It's affected all of us in one way or another. I'm going to surmise that all of us have learned some things or remembered some things about what we may have taken for granted, about what is truly most important. Some of us have learned a few things about ourselves and what it means to lean on and trust in God. Hopefully, that learning continues. In the sermons that we've preached here at First United Methodist of Waxahachie over the past several weeks during the season of Lent, we have heard the stories of Bible characters who were a part of the drama of Holy Week. I hope that you have noticed how the people in the stories we have examined are really so very much like you and me today. How we are now, or how we were at one point in our lives, or even how we would someday hope to be. The person whose story we will look at today is not like some of us. Instead, his story is like all of us. This morning, I invite you, as best you are able, to open yourself to God and the power of the Scriptures as we consider the story of Barabbas. Let's pray together. Do what you so faithfully do, O Lord, as we open ourselves to you. Help us hear from you to gratefully receive from your hand whatever it is we need to be more faithful followers of your Son, our Savior. Though we are apart from one another, by your Spirit bring us together in making us your church, both this day and in the days to come. Amen. Barabbas was a man who, according to the Gospels, was being held in a Roman prison at the time of Jesus' trial in Jerusalem. Matthew, in the gospel that we heard read to us this morning, says he was a notable prisoner, but he doesn't tell us the exact nature of his crime. John says he was a robber. Mark and Luke both agree that he had been arrested for insurrection and murder. And if that was the case... If he was guilty of those crimes, 
then Barabbas may have been one of the zealots. The, the zealots wanted to throw off the yoke of Roman oppress, oppression and occupation by force, whatever it took. They would have been considered terrorists to the Romans, but to Jewish nationalists, they might have been called freedom fighters. I recall that when Georgia and I lived in Ireland for a time with our then only child, our daughter Paige, it was so interesting to hear the different perspectives that people had on the Irish Republican Army, uh, branded by the United States government and others as a terrorist organization. But there were some folks, nationalists, what they called Republicans there, who considered them as freedom fighters. That's the way it was with the zealots in Jesus' day. Now, according to three of the Gospels, Pilate used to sort of calm the crowd at this excited and boisterous time of year. When the crowds came in to celebrate Passover in Jerusalem, uh, he would, we are told, uh, sort of calm them by releasing one prisoner of their choice. Perhaps this was a gesture of goodwill. Maybe it was something that he had sort of picked up on and decided to do as a way of getting past a time when for these Jewish nationalists and uh, religious fervor ran high. Now there are some questions that scholars ask about how established this tradition was because it is not mentioned in any other ancient literature. It may have been a long-standing custom, and we just don't have record of it. Or maybe it was only under the governorship of Pontius Pilate. I can easily imagine that. He'd sort of picked up on or um, been advised. This would be a good way, way to get us through this. And in this case, it would have been a custom, but only during those years during which Pilate was the governor. One thing that all four Gospels agree on is that the choice between the prisoners was between Jesus and Barabbas. When we read the story, we get the sense that Pilate did not want to sentence Jesus to death. He sort of took his side and asked the crowd, I don't see what the big deal is. Maybe he saw, at this juncture of the story, one last chance to try and find a way to let Jesus go. We can be almost certain that there were more prisoners in jail at that time than just Jesus and Barabbas. So I could imagine Pilate saying to one of his guards or assistants, make sure that one of the people you bring out is that Galilean. Make sure that Jesus guy from Nazareth is one of the two that are brought forward. Perhaps he assumed, surely, given the choice between these two, whether he was a notable robber, robber um, or a murderer and, ex, and um, insurrectionist, and this other guy, surely they'd choose the one that he wanted to get off the hook. We are told that the Jewish leaders sort of uh, urged the crowd to call for Barabbas' release and for Jesus to be executed. And Pilate eventually gave in and handed Jesus over to be crucified. And nothing more is known about Barabbas after he was let go. So I wonder about him. And over the coming few minutes, I invite you to wonder about him with me. Here's one possibility. Maybe Barabbas realized he got a break. Maybe he thanked his lucky stars that he was let go, and maybe he changed his ways after this close call. Sometimes that's the way it happens to people. They get scared by seeing what almost happened in their lives. They decide to listen to a different voice, the voice of, Law and order, or reason, hopefully the voice of God. It, seem, it may seem like something of an oversimplification, but it's my sincere belief that this is a big part of what the Bible and the Holy Scriptures are all about. 
God instructs us, gives us warnings, gives us examples from history, and says, please choose that which is right and good. But many people do not. I recall, as many of you do, when the terrorist attacks of 9-11 took place back in 2001. The next Sunday was the biggest church attendance I've ever experienced, including Easter Sundays. People were afraid. People came together. People became kind and loving. They drew their families and loved ones close to them. They said things to them that they could have said and probably should have said in the past. After a while, many settled back into their old habits. And church attendance at almost all churches sort of returned to about what it had been before. Right now, many people are frightened by the COVID-19 virus. I wonder what we are learning. I wonder if it will make a difference. I wonder if we might be changed. I wonder if we're learning something about the many days that we have taken our health for granted. I wonder if we have noticed this shift that I have certainly noticed that um, all of a sudden in the news, we're not hearing about political tensions between nations. We're not hearing about uh, sanctions against countries about trying to bring others in line. We're not hearing about threats of war, the saber rattling between nations. We've shifted our focus to something that threatens all of us, regardless of nationality or political persuasion or religious belief. Here's something I believe is universally true about human beings. We either learn the easy way, through warning, through the lessons of history, through the words of Scripture, through the teachings of wisdom, or we learn the hard way, through trial and error, through bitter experience, or we don't learn at all. Maybe Barabbas learned. Maybe he made the most of his second chance. There's another, a second possibility, is that maybe Barabbas just kept on doing what he had always done, whether he was an insurrectionist or a thief or a murderer, and that's the way it is with some people. Some live their lives oblivious to the ways that God is working on helping them. They don't care about what God has done. They ignore God's signs and signals. One of the most difficult things that we do here at the church, not in terms of uh, it being physically difficult, but mentally and spiritually difficult, is trying to figure out how to use most effectively the resources we are given. What I mean by that is, sometimes we are asked to help human need. We are often asked to help human need. People come to us who are in a bind relationally, financially, legally. We know, and I hope that we will remember, that the fallout for this current crisis is going to affect people for months to come. Stimulus checks will come, but it's not going to bail everybody out. Even if there is a speedy resolution to the spread of the COVID-19 virus, We know that folks are going to have a tough time for months to come. People come to us, they have lost jobs, they've lost their income, um, and we know that these sorts of of occasions really hurt those who are most vulnerable, those on the the lowest rung of the economic ladder. Uh, Someone comes and needs help to keep their electricity on. They need help to keep their water on. We're happy to help. We are brokers of the money that you give to help meet human need. We try and be so responsible. And we will try our best to help them longer term. Have you thought about what's going to happen next month? Can you put a little bit of this back? 
Can you call your landlord and make arrangements? Can we help you some way? Can we put you in touch with consumer credit counseling? It's free. They'll help you set up a budget. They'll give you some relief from your creditors. In most cases, they're not interested. And it's not too long before they need more help and more and more and more. We realize at that point they're not ready to make a change. So we have to set limits. It's difficult. It's agonizing. But this happens in all sorts of ways, doesn't it? Not just in terms of money. It happens with alcohol or drugs or our performance at work or our marriage, or our relationship with our kids, or our relationship with God, we get in trouble, there's a crisis, we are afraid, someone helps, we catch a break. But we go back to the same way of living. Maybe being set free didn't have any effect at all on Barabbas. A third possibility is that maybe he realized he got a break Maybe he thanked his lucky stars. Maybe he prayed to God. Maybe he determined to change, but couldn't. That's a reality in many people's lives. They really, truly, sincerely want to change. They intend to change, but they can't. The old friends, the old places, the lure of the old habits. They have a strong pull on us, even when we want to change. Maybe that's what happened to Barabbas. Maybe he ended up like one of those persons who are really all around us, feeling guilty, feeling bad, carrying around this guilt and shame. And it's not just the thing we did, it's the thing that keeps happening, the thing we promised we'd never do again the guilt that we have before God in making these sincere promises and then not being able to connect in such a way that the change actually happens. I would want to remind us all that that person, the person in that sort of situation, is still loved by God. Our faith tells us that God's heart is touched by people who sense their needs. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That was the reason, I think, that Jesus kept spending so much of his time with the people he spent time with. What did he say? It's not the healthy who have need of a physician, but the ones who are sick. God keeps trying to make that connection happen, keeps trying to help that change occur. There's one last possibility that I want to mention, and this is one I like. It cannot be proven, but I... I hope it. Perhaps it was a combination of all the aforementioned possibilities. Maybe Barabbas was just glad to be alive. Maybe he was so elated to have escaped imprisonment. And then he went back to his old ways until he began to think more carefully about what had happened to him. Maybe it was after the resurrection when the church began to grow when the story of Jesus and the good news of the gospel of grace began to spread, that he realized, that's what happened to me. That's the way God feels about me. And he realized and absorbed something which caused him to reach out and embrace the gospel. I hope that that was the case. And thankfully, this is what happens to many people. They go their way, they struggle, they don't think about God until something happens. Sometimes it takes a while. It may be an unfortunate event. In my experience, it's the bad things that tend to turn people toward God rather than the good and happy occasions. Sometimes it's maturity that happens to us. We grow up and get what we want, and then we realize there's got to be more than this. The hollow emptiness that results from self-seeking and sin and self-gratification haunts us. And something slowly, ever so slowly, begins to happen in us, and we realize, I really do need something more. I wonder if that will happen to some of us during 
and after the present crisis. I wonder if the thoughts we are thinking now, the need we are experiencing, the recognition of what has most value will somehow over time sink in, get to us. Maybe we'll change and understand that faith and family and kindness and caring are things to to treasure and develop and share. I pray that it will be so. John Russell served as pastor of the Boston Avenue United Methodist Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, until he was elected a bishop in the United Methodist Church, and then he came down this direction to serve the North Texas Conference of the Church as bishop there. Bishop Russell was always so nice to me. Um, I was just a young pup. Uh, There was no reason to take any special notice of me, but he was always so kind and interested, both when I was in Oklahoma and uh, when I served in Texas during seminary when he was down here. He told the story of one day when a man who worked in a downtown bank, I assume in either Dallas or Fort Worth, they were together at one point in the same Episcopal area, uh, had invited him and several other men to lunch. Bishop Russell arrived early, was sitting in the bank lobby. He was supposed to meet the man's secretary, but he didn't know her. A woman finally came down in the elevator, and he thought, perhaps this is the woman. He kept sitting there. The woman walked over to the door, looked out on the street, looking out. Bishop Russell decided she must be the secretary that I'm supposed to meet, but he didn't say anything. After a while, she turned back around, and she walked over to Bishop Russell, and she said, do you know Bishop John Russell? And he said, yes, I do know him. I know him quite well. She said, Well, if you see him come in the door, would you tell me? He said, sure. If I see him come in the door, I'll tell you. She said she was going to be somewhere else for a few minutes, but would be right back. And when she came back, she walked over to Bishop Russell, and she said, have you seen him come in the door? He said, I have not. She said, do you think Bishop Russell would be late? He said, no, I think Bishop Russell would be the kind of guy that would be early, if anything. He waited a moment more, and then he said, I've been teasing you. I'm Bishop Russell. She straightened up, stared at him, did not say one word. After a long pause, looking him up and down, she said, you don't look like a bishop. He said, what does a bishop look like? And she said, beats me, I'm a Baptist. (laughs) If I asked you what Barabbas looked like, you probably wouldn't know. You could guess, you may get a few things right based on his Semitic ethnicity. But what if I asked you this? What does someone look like who's gotten off the hook in a big way? What if I asked you, would you recognize someone who has taken for granted the mercy of God, broken their promises to God about things that they said they'd never do again or begin to do and never got started? What if I said, have you ever seen someone who allowed the goodness and mercy of God to eventually change them, melt their hearts, help them live lives of gratitude for all they've received but not deserved? I'll bet you could recognize that kind of person. One of them is preaching to you right now. There's another one sitting on your left or your right. There are more of them that you pass in the aisles of the store and in the lanes of the highway. And there's one looking back at each of us in the mirror. Barabbas is representative of us all in a way. Like him, Because of things beyond our control, we've been forgiven and set free. What do you suppose we should do in response to that? Amen.
Last night I lay asleeping, there came a dream so fair. I stood in old Jerusalem beside the temple there. I heard the children singing, and ever as they sang, I thought the voice of angels from heaven in answer rang. I thought the voice of angels from heaven in answer rang.
May this coming week be truly holy for you, made sacred by the presence, strength, and guidance of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. Go forward in his name and in his peace. Amen.